play one of those word association games. It's like, I'll say a word and you're supposed to say the first thing that comes into your mind. So a lot of times it's, if I say mom, the first thing people think of is dad or peanut butter, jelly. So when I say the word wait, what is the first thing that you think of? For me, it's not really even a word. It's just kind of a, <sighs> because a lot of times whenever we think of waiting, it has this negative connotation, this feeling of why? Why do I have to wait? Why do I have to not get what I want right now? Why can't it be instant? And so growing up in the church, there was this verse or part of a verse that was used a lot. Um, and it's really stuck with me. And so Psalm 37, 7 says, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. And so I remember growing up and in my head, just having this truth, be still before the Lord, wait patiently for him. And those words, wait patiently for him. Um, four words that growing up, it can be very easy to just kind of, oh yeah, I know. Be still before the Lord, wait patiently for him. God's going to show up. It's going to be great. Um, we know all of the good verses of Jeremiah 29 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you this amazing future and this hope. Um, and a lot of times we cling to verses like that, but we don't look one verse um, prior to that, Jeremiah 29 10, which says, and the Lord says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. And then verse 11 goes into, for I know the plans I have for you. And so we see kind of this disconnect of God has these amazing plans for us and we hold on to this idea. But the very verse before it, we we totally take out of context. We we just grab these verses and we we know who God is, but we ignore the parts that we don't want to see. And so Jeremiah is saying 70 years you're going to go through a lot in that time, but the Lord will be faithful and he will fulfill my promise to you when I bring you back to this place. And so that idea of waiting, um, again, it's not fun. It's not fun to think about um, because we live in a world where things are instant. Things are, I want it now, so I'm going to get it now. If you see something online you want at checkout, you click express delivery. You can get it by the end of the day. Um, you're hungry, go through a drive through You will have it. You don't even have to get out of your car. Um, you're lonely, Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, you can text anyone. You can get in contact with anyone in the world in seconds. And we feel like if people take more than a couple minutes to respond, then it's the, it's the end of the world. And so technology and all of these things that are fast, um, commercials that say, act now, why wait? That's not the worst thing in the world, but I'm, I'm afraid that the world has sent us this message that if you have to wait for it, something's wrong. And a lot of times we take that idea and we put it on our relationship with God and say, if God isn't showing up the way you want him to, if you're not getting everything that you want right now, if it feels like you're in this in-between season of I have these dreams, but God, I feel like I'm stuck over here. If you're not getting what you want, it's this idea of something's wrong with you or God's mad at you. And so we have these ideas, but in scripture, we see that there couldn't be anything further from the truth. Um, we see in the book of Job, um, maybe you're familiar with the story. If not, just a quick rundown because it's 42 chapters. Um, there's this man named Job. And in chapter one of Job, it says, I love this story. It says, Job chapter one, verse one, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. And there were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people in the East. And then it goes on to talk about how this man not only was blessed, but he honored God. And he would, this is this is in a time before Jesus came, so he had to make sacrifices in order to get forgiveness for his sins. And he would do the same for his children. So we see that this man was not only 
blessed and wealthy and well-known, had a good reputation in his, in his circle of influence, in the place that he was at. But we see that he loved the Lord, that he was seeking after him. And so later in this chapter, um, spoiler alert, uh, please read this book. It's incredible. Um, but we see the beginning of suffering. We see this description of Job and how much he's blessed. But Satan comes to the Lord and says, there is no one on earth that loves you. And God says, have you considered my servant Job? And this description that we see of him is given by God, that he's upright and blameless, that no one, no one is as faithful as Job. Um, not that Job is perfect, but he's seeking after the Lord. And Satan says, you have blessed him with everything. You have, you have treated him um, like he's a king. You've given him, given him this family. You've given him wealth. You've given him all of these things. Um, of course he loves you. Why wouldn't, he, why wouldn't you love someone that gives you anything you want? And so Satan says, but I tell you what, if you take all of that away, Job is going to look at you and basically spit in your face and say, you're not good. And so God allows Satan to tempt Job. Um, and I think it's very clear in this point that we need to make a distinction that God does not go in and wreck Job's life. God does not say, all right, Job, this has been fun, but like, good try, but it's over. God allows Satan to do this. Um, and I think it's really easy to get confused of when we go through suffering, when we go through trials or the season of waiting. Um, it's easy to look at God and say, what are you doing? What have I done wrong? What What is going on? I'm trying to seek after you or I'm not that bad of a person or we have all of these things that we feel angry. We feel bitter of God. Have you completely forgotten me? What are you doing? Have you lost your mind? But we see Oh, the last verse uh, or at verse 12, the end of it says, so Satan went out from the Lord's presence and then Job loses everything. But we see this distinction of Satan has to leave in order for this to happen. And so this is crucial and we're going to come back to this point, but it's so important to see that God does not cause God does not look at your life and say, oh, man, it's pretty good, but let's just throw some struggle in there. Let's throw some waiting. Like, let's let's really see if you love me. God does what he does because he's so good. And he has a plan that if we're right here, if we're too close to it, we can't see that he has a purpose. And so speeding up the story, all of these terrible things happen to Job. He loses his entire family. Um, all of the camels and the donkeys and everything that we read about are taken away. They're killed. Um, all of his possessions gone. And his wife looks at him and is like, you need to curse God and die. I don't know what you did wrong, um, but th this is not working out. And Job says profound words um, in Job chapter two. He says, shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? And so Job is making this distinction of we receive good from God and this evil that God allows to happen, not that God causes but that he allows to happen in our lives. How can we say, God, you're good until something in our life doesn't exactly go like we want and we say, God, who do you think you are? But it's realizing God is so much bigger than me. God is so much greater than what I see right in front of me. And so then Satan attacks Job's health. Um, and so that's that's chapter one and two of Job. And so for the next 39 chapters, Job's friends come. And basically, we've all had these people in our lives that have the best of intentions. But basically, all of this stuff is going wrong in your life. So what did you do? What did you do wrong that God is punishing you? Um, Well-meaning friends. But that's like going back to the beginning. That's what we assume is you're you're suffering. What have you done wrong? You have to wait. You're not getting this instantly. You need to fix something. Something needs to change. And so this happens for 39 chapters. And then in, ver in chapter 42, um, Job has suffered. Job has gone through all of this with his friends. Job has done a lot of soul searching. Um, Job has not been perfect by any stance, but he has not looked at God and questioned his goodness. Um, and so in 42, Job is speaking with the Lord. Um, and we see in verse 10, 
it says, and the Lord restored the fortunes of Job. And when he had prayed for his friends, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had had before. And, and then he goes into all these things with restoring family and giving possessions and doing all of these things. Um, and so it's easy to look at this story and say, that was intense. That was that was a 42 chapters. I can't believe like all of the suffering that happened, um, all this in between. And then the end. Wow, that that's a crazy story. But look, God restored. And it's so easy to look at stories like this or look at stories in other people's lives or even your own. And it's a lot easier to tell a story once it's over and you know how it ends. It's easy to say, this is how it happened. This is kind of the middle, but look at what God did. It's really exciting to do that. That's one of my favorite things to do is look at what God's doing or what he's done. Um, But it's easy to just kind of breeze over the middle part. It's easy to kind of condense it and there was suffering and then there's restoration and then there's freedom and then there's joy and then it feels like everything's going right again and we we rush to get to that point but we see 39 out of 42 chapters is job in the middle is job suffering is job waiting and i think that there's a big lesson we can learn from that because we're all waiting for something um, maybe, maybe you're like Joe, maybe you've had things taken away from you. Um, I know for me a couple years ago, my dad lost his job, um, him having a wife, having three kids, um, two of my three sisters, like us in college, um, how are we going to pay the bills? How are we going to do all of these things? Um, and it's a scary thought. And so for two years, my dad not having a job and thinking, God, are you, are you here? Do you care? Um, It's so easy sometimes to pray a day or two very passionately, very, God, I trust you. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. It's easy to have these prayers um, and even pray scripture. But we still kind of go back to this mentality of, okay, why hasn't God answered yet? Why hasn't he answered this prayer? What am I doing wrong? Maybe, Maybe I just need to take control. Maybe I need to step in. Maybe I know better than God. And we don't say words like that, but with our lives, we do all the time. Because we're all waiting for something. We're all putting our hope in something. Whether it's popularity, if I can just get in this group of friends, if I can just be her friend, if I can just, oh, if I can just arrive, then I'll be happy. Or maybe it's if I can just look the part. I remember middle school, if I could just look like her. All of my worries will go away and I will have, I'll have it all. Maybe if I can just be smart enough and make this grade and get through middle school, then I'll be good. And I can, I can begin my life. I can really start going because right now this isn't what I had in mind. Maybe it's God. I am so ready to honor you. I'm ready to live for you. I just need you to get me through whatever this part is. Um, Because you're good and you're all of these things, but I'd like to do big things for you, so I need you to hurry up. And it's easy, it's easy to look at our circumstances and thank God where you at. But oh, it's it's so cool to see, like the shirt my sister actually sent me just this week. He's in the waiting. Um, A lot of times we start waiting for these gifts. We start waiting for healing. We start waiting for, I'm ready for high school. I'm ready to graduate. I'm ready for my life to begin. I'm ready for a relationship. I'm ready for God to tell me what's my purpose. What do I need to be when I grow up? What do I, what does it need to look like with my family? We look for all of these things, which, which are good, which God gives us gifts. But in this seasons of season of waiting, we're so quick to say, if I could just get to this point and we press on and we go and we go and we go and we go, that we miss out on being with the giver because we're so focused on the gift. We miss out on what God is doing right now and teaching us to be patient, teaching us to press into him, to go before him with genuine prayers of, God, I'm hurting. God, I'm upset. God, I'm I, I want to believe that your word is true. Help me. Because we don't just wake up one day and everything just, whoop, it's perfect. We don't wake up like that. I know I don't. Um, 
I know there's a lot of days I wake up and I pray, God, I have no idea what you're doing, but I trust your goodness. And I heard a quote one time and it said, we, we trust in God's goodness today so we see his faithfulness tomorrow. And we see that God shows up again and again all throughout scripture. He makes promises to Abraham. He makes promises to Moses of deliverance, of freedom. Um, to Esther, I will free this entire group of people. But we see that things don't just happen overnight. We see sometimes, like in Jeremiah, it's 70 years. We see in Job, it's 39 chapters. We see this promise of Jesus in the Old Testament, and it's thousands of years later before an angel comes to Mary and says, you will, you will become pregnant and it will be the son of God. But there's a, there's a common thread here that when God is in it, it doesn't just happen. And I, I've heard the quote too, the best things are worth waiting for. And so I would really challenge you, what are you waiting for? I know for me in middle school, um, I, in the words of one of my friends, I would snack on things. Um, one of my friends said, we're not hungry for the word because we're too busy snacking on things of the world. And to put that in context, I'm not, I'm not hungry for God. I'm not longing to be in his presence, to read the Bible, to pray to him, to be with other believers, because I'm so busy trying to be pretty enough. I'm so busy trying to get the right grades or make the team or figure out the rest of my life. And I'm missing who Jesus is. And it's, it's, it's crazy to think about that God will use something that's not pleasant to bring about something greater than we could have ever imagined. Some, some things we don't even think to pray for. But who do we think God is? A man named A.W. Tozer says, mm. What comes to our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And so I challenge you, what do you, who do you think God is? When you think of him, what words come to mind? It's, it's really interesting. Um, there are two words specifically that I think of whenever I think of God in the waiting. Um, the first one is powerful. No matter what you're in the season of waiting for, no matter what you're struggling with, um, do you believe that God is powerful? That if there just seems to be some, some relationship, some problem, some stress at home, some thing that you're facing, that it just feels like I cannot get around this. There's just, I don't know how I'm going to get over this. I don't know how I'm going to get past this. I don't know how God can use this for good. He is so much more powerful than we, we can even wrap our minds around. Um, and the second one, powerful but loving. God is our Heavenly Father. He loves us like no one else ever has, ever will. Um, oh, We see that believing God is loving means that there's care and purpose behind everything that he does. Um, he owes us absolutely nothing but he still gives us so much more than we could ever deserve. Um, the book of James talks about God giving us more grace. Um, it's one of my favorite scriptures right now. And you can even take out the word grace and put a blank. God gives more love. God gives more patience. I know I knew a lot of it. God gives more forgiveness. God gives more of himself than we could ever hope to hope to have. Um, even through the times whenever we aren't sure if God cares if it feels like God is silent he promises to never leave us or forsake us he promises that he's going to restore us and it doesn't always look like what we want it to it doesn't always have an ending like Job of God giving three times as much of things that we can see but I would challenge you what are you putting your hope in because if you know Jesus, if you're a Christian, if you've asked him to come into your heart forever, we have hope forever. And even if he doesn't give you everything that's on your checklist right now, what a beautiful gift 
because we have today and tomorrow and the rest of our lives and eternity with Jesus. And if you don't know what it means to be a Christian, if you've never made that decision, I, I would really challenge you um, to say, what, what am I waiting for? What am I putting my hope in? Because again, we're all putting our hope into something. We're all looking to the things either of the world or to the Lord to fill this gap in our heart. But we see that we're sinful. We see that God made us beautifully and perfectly and with great purpose and in great love, but we missed it. And we chose to not wait for him. We chose to be God in our own lives. And we chose to sin. We chose to disobey. But God loved us so much and he's so powerful that he didn't say, wow, they blew it. We had a good run, good two days in the Garden of Eden. He didn't say they blew it, it's over. He said, I love you so much, I'm going to get you. And he sent his son, he sent Jesus to be, the Bible says, the propitiation. And that means to cover. That means to take our place. That means Jesus came and took all of your sin and my sin and he took it and he bore it on the cross and he died a death he didn't deserve because he was perfect he never sinned he never did anything wrong but he took your sin and he took mine and he said I love them so much that I'm going to take this punishment and he died and if the story stopped there there'd be no purpose in me even talking to you but he didn't stay dead because every single enemy not only sin, not only the fears that we have or the doubts that we become consumed by, but even to the extent of death, Jesus defeated. And on the third day of his, after he was crucified, after he was murdered, after he was killed and took our sin, he rose again and he was alive. And today he's with the Father in heaven. And we have this, we have this amazing opportunity that has nothing to do with what we can do. It has nothing to do with being a good person or trying hard enough or going to church. Although going to church and striving to look like Jesus, those are beautiful things. But salvation has nothing to do with us. And it's accepting this free gift. It's realizing I have missed it. I have messed up. I've sinned against a perfect God. But it's believing that he loves you so much that he sent the perfect son of God to take your place. And all you have to do is accept him into your heart. Say, Jesus, I'm not perfect, but you are. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for waiting for me. Thank you for chasing me down. Thank you for who you are. And I ask you to come into my life. I ask you to make my life not about me. I ask you to change me to look more like you. Even though I won't be perfect, I thank you that you are enough. And so I pray that you will make that decision. Um, I pray that if you already know Jesus, that you will take a serious look at what are you waiting for? What are you putting your hope in? Because the gifts that God gives, they're amazing. They're good. They can be used for his glory. But are we so focused on the gifts that we miss out on the giver and the true joy and freedom that comes from knowing a perfect God, a good God that loves us more than anything? So I'm going to pray, even though this is for Wednesday. Um, dear God, I just thank you for this day, Lord. And I thank you for what you've been teaching me in this season of waiting. Um, I thank you for me getting frustrated um, at my situations, but how good you have been, how faithful you've been to keep showing up, to keep pursuing me, to keep loving me, um, and to keep asking me if you're still good, God. And I thank you that you're showing me that you are. Um, I pray for this summer and I pray for the season of waiting of what the summer is going to look like, God, but I pray that you'll go ahead and prepare the hearts of the campers that are coming. Um, I pray that you will stir in their hearts what are they putting their hope in what are they pressing into God and I pray that you would reveal to so many this summer that you are worth it that you are the true living hope um, and that you're better than anything else that this world could ever offer God I love you and I thank you for this time um, I pray for the team that will be watching this video um, I pray that you will be glorified through their conversations and that you will make 
their decision very clear. Um, God, we love you. We trust you in your name. Amen.